Hey, Amanda. Hey, Allison. Hello. Hey, just just a heads up. We've been getting um, internet instability messages <laughs> for the last couple of hours. So I hope this goes. Oh well. no. Yeah. Well, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. So what's the format for this? Are you going to ask questions or am I going to do just a summary of the international section or both or? Um, both. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll start by having you introduce yourself. And then from there, um, I'll start asking you questions. OK. Mm -hmm. We'll start in about two minutes. All right, so it is 3.30, so I will get started. So good evening, everyone. I wanted to welcome you to today's roundtable discussion and fifth panel of the Law Students Section Meet and Greet series. This evening's discussion will feature attorneys from the International Section, the Women in Law Section, the Young Lawyer Section, and the LGBTQ Law Section, where they will be providing you with a better understanding on experiences, rewards, challenges they faced practicing while offering insight on the various career opportunities available in each of these areas of law. During this live program, participants are welcome to post questions using the Q&A tab or chat function in the Zoom portal. There will be an open Q&A session after each panel and at the end of the program for any additional questions you may have. At this time, if my stuff wants to work, um, I will... <laughs> Introduce to you the international law section. Um, Torsten, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Bad German, will, bad German name. Yeah. He will be discussing the international section with you guys. If you just want to briefly um, introduce yourself and tell them a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, so I've been practicing law for about 20, gosh, three years or so now. Uh, my primary area of practice is commercial litigation. I'm a partner in the um, DC office of Hunt and Andrews Kurth. I originally started practicing in New York, but moved down to DC in about 2006, but I still keep a foot uh, in our New York office and travel back and forth quite a bit. Um, a, a good part of my practice is devoted to international arbitration, uh, transnational litigation, and helping clients from abroad with litigation in the United States. Perfect. Um, so let's get started with your questions. Your first question is going to be, how did you decide on your practice area? Uh, uh, I didn't really. So I, you know, I, I knew I wanted to do um, international work. I spent a year abroad during law school and during college uh, and really enjoyed traveling and experiencing different cultures. Um, during law school, I really enjoyed uh, comparative law uh, the country where I studied was a civil law system versus our common law system. I found that very interesting. So I started by joining a firm in New York that did uh, almost exclusively uh, work for foreign companies that were active in the United States. And um, in that firm, they had two tracks, commercial um, transactions and commercial litigation, basically. And so when I showed up, I was told I was going into the commercial litigation track, and uh, that's how it all got started. So very little 
choice in choosing litigation, a lot of choice in trying to choose something that had some sort of international angle to it. Okay, and how has your section supported you in your career? So I, I got started, it's really evolved over time. Um, I got started in the section, and I, I apologize, I don't have the video on, but I, my camera is not connecting for some reason. Because uh, when I ping pong between Zoom and Teams meetings, it goes a little haywire. Um, the section really has been very different for me over the years. I first got involved in it uh, through the publications in it. Um, one of the folks who I worked for at the time was the lead editor of the Practicum publication. Uh, and he introduced me to the section and he had me doing a lot of editing of articles for that publication. And so I did that for a number of years. Um, eventually I took that position over uh, and I'm, I've served as the editor in chief of one of our two publications for a long time now. Um, and so the, through the publishing part of it, I got to know it and has stayed with that. And that's always been a great uh, source of connection to the section for me. And the articles that I've edited over the years and the people I've connected with as the authors have been super interesting. Um, more, you know, in the last maybe five or 10 years, the section really has developed into a great network of uh, referrals, both for work uh, inbound and outbound. Um, I'll give you a brief example. I have a, a friend who I've known in the section from uh, France for many, many years. And just in the last year, I've had the, the good fortune of having a case involving French law that I was able to uh, reach out to him for advice on. Uh, and I've gotten similar outreach for advice from members around the world. It's also, frankly, been a really great source of social connections and friendship. I've gotten to know a lot of the people, both in New York and around the world, uh, through participation in different events like um, you know, we have an annual conference every year somewhere in the world. Uh, last year we um, had it in London. This year, just last month, we were in Mexico City, and next year we're going to be in Seoul, Korea. And so you get um, you get to know people from around the world at those conferences, and it's always fun to see them and reconnect with them and and build on not only work relationships but also social relationships. Perfect. And what was one misconception you had during law school? about your area of practice? Um, probably that all international travel is really interesting and fun. <laughs> it is, uh, especially when it's work related, a lot of times it's interesting and fun. Um, and sometimes it's uh, it's not. It's, uh, it's tough to get on a plane, you know, every week for a few weeks in a row sometimes. Uh, sometimes places you go are not super glamorous. And a lot of times, you go somewhere interesting and you're sitting in a conference room where you may as well be, you know, sitting in your living room at home instead of wherever, whatever interesting location you're in. So I think I over glamorized the travel aspect of it a little bit, but other than that, um, other than that, it's been a really fun and interesting career. And what are some things that the international section offers law students? Uh, so a, a lot of stuff. Um, one of the easiest entry points, I think, for law students is in part the entry point, what the entry point for me was, and those are the publications in the section. Um, so we have two publications. One is an international law review, which is a law review style publication uh, with more academic articles and uh, citation formats. And then we have a, a less formal publication called the International Law Practicum where the articles are three to five pages long. Uh, the citation format is simple end notes. And the articles are really just intended to be for informational purposes for our international readership on whatever topic of law grabs the author's interest. Um, so these are great opportunities for law students to pick something interesting to them and write something short about it. Um, it's very easy to pair a law student up with a member of the section as a mentor in writing an article like that. And the result is, you know, the law student has a published article before they even leave law school, which is a, a great thing to put on the resume. Um, in addition to that, we have, as I mentioned, conferences um, and meetings around the world. We have our big formal conference. We have regional conferences in different places in the world um, on a, you know, semi-annual basis, I would say. There's 
one that's smaller and less formal than the big meeting. Um, and then we also frequently have webinars and online meetings. And all of those things are open to law students to join and interact with membership, et cetera. And what's one piece of advice that you would give a law student? Um, get really comfortable with generative AI because <laughs> it's either going to be your friend or your enemy. And it's, I think it's going to be easy to make it your friend. Um, I think it's e with very little effort. I think it's going to be easy to make it your friend and adopt it and understand its role and what we as lawyers do. Um, I think it will play a, a very increasingly important role, especially in the, um, in the jobs of people just coming out of law school. All right. Um, anything else you'd like to say about the international section, like that you may offer or any other insight? Sure, yeah, I'll give you a little just sort of rundown and some statistics about the, um, the section. Um, we have chapters all around the world. I think we have 70 in total. Uh, we're in on every continent except Antarctica. And those are local chapters that are oftentimes driven by local bar associations. And they, they include many people who have studied in New York or who have LLMs. Although there is no requirement in our section to, uh, to be a New York lawyer or even a US lawyer. So we have plenty of lawyers in our section who are foreign lawyers um, who are just interested in interacting with our section and the New York lawyers that are part of it. Uh, so anybody who's a lawyer can join. We have very, very um, good breadth around the world and very active chapters around the world with which we interact. We also have a very active Latin American council and an Asian bar council that is uh, specific to lawyers in those regions and so if a law student has particular interest in either of those geographic regions, it's very easy to get connected into those councils and meet people that are practicing in those areas. Um, as I mentioned, we, we have a, a large global conference every year. We also have regional conferences and uh, less formal meetings, both online and live. And uh, everybody gets notice of those in the section, including students who join the section. And they're, of course, always welcome to join in all those meetings and meet people and build relationships. Um, we also have a number of, um, of topic areas um, that are formed sort of like committees and the people on those committees are focused on particular areas of law and oftentimes we'll collaborate on putting out thought pieces related to those areas of law. And some of the ones that we have uh, right now in existence are, for example, an ESG committee, Environmental, Social, and Governance Committee, uh, Rule of Law Committee, which is an increasingly important issue internationally as we see these various disputes around the world. Um, we have committees on investor state arbitration, on international trust and states planning, on microfinance, on investment in Latin America, uh, on the status of Hong Kong, cross-border litigation in Asia, and, and many more. But essentially, if there's a, an area that a student is very interested in and wants to, for example, build a, a conference around it, build a webinar around it, write an article around it, it's very easy to plug into a committee that's related to that area or to form a committee in that area. Um, other than that, I think the big thing I wanted to mention was about our two publications, which I've already covered. Perfect. So I'm going to open up for questions. So if anyone has any questions, you can put it right in the Q&A. Um, while we wait for questions. <laughs> while um, we wait, I actually have one more plug for us. That is, um, we have a LinkedIn page, and uh, it's called the New York State Bar Association International Section. And you can follow us there to get updates on what's going on in the section. Okay, so it looks like you have about eight minutes left. No questions currently. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I think I think that's it. Um, I'll do another pitch for the ease uh, with which a law student can get involved in publishing. And if anybody's interested, I'd love for them to reach out to me. And I'm happy to talk to them about um, whether they have an idea for an article or if they need an idea for an article and what the process for that looks like. Um, I'm, I don't know if my email address is part of this presentation or not, but I'm happy to 
give it out. It's on the web too, of course, um, but it's T-K-R-A-C-H-T at Hunton, H-U-N-T-O-N.com. Perfect. So it looks like we have one question. It's what other sections of law do you interact with? Environmental question mark. Um, I personally don't interact with um, environmental very much. I've had isolated cases over the years. Um, that's sort of a function of our firm, though, frankly. Our firm has a very strong uh, environmental practice, and it has its own set of specialized litigators in that area. So I've had cases, for example, I've had commercial real estate uh, cases that have an environmental component to them. So I've been exposed to it from that perspective. Um, but if it's really heavy duty or pure environmental litigation, we have people that do that as a specialty. Also, can you repeat your email, but slowly? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, and I don't know if chat is available on webinars, but I can post in the chat too, but it's T K R A C H T. So first initial last name at Hunton, H U N T O N.com. I sent it as well. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, so it doesn't look like we have any additional questions on top, but it does look like we have our next panel on. So I am going to thank you for your time and I appreciate you talking on behalf of the international section. Oh, thanks very much. We, we appreciate it. And um, we're here for any questions and hope to see some of the people listening join as members. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so next um, talking will be the women in law section. We have Allison and Kimberly. Um, They're speaking on behalf of their section. If you just want to briefly introduce yourself and yeah. Sounds good. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kim Wolf Price. Um, I am an attorney, but my role right now at a law firm is uh, Chief Strategy and Diversity Officer at Bond Shenick and King. I sit in the Syracuse office, but we have offices all over New York and a few other states. I am the current chair of the Women in Law section. Um, it is my honor and privilege to be able to have that role. I've been active in the state bar since I was in law school. Um, and I chaired a committee before and simultaneously I'm chairing a committee while I chair a section. I also chair the well-being committee for the New York State Bar Association. So I'm um, happy to answer any questions you have. I started practice in Manhattan at a giant law firm, um, worked at a law school for a little while, teaching and doing other things. So we're glad to have you here. And I'm glad to have Allie with us. Thanks, Kim. Thanks for having me with you. <laughs> So, Allie, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So, my name is Allie Wacker. I have been in financial services compliance for over 17 years. It is a little bit of a different yet related legal profession. So, something to keep in mind as you're in school, thinking about what you want to do and where you want to maybe be or, you know, land as you take your first next steps out of school. Like Kim is also saying, there are a lot of options, a lot of alternatives to really spend some time exploring. Absolutely. And thanks, Amanda, for having us here today. Yes, oh, I'm excited. Um, okay, so first question for you guys is how did you decide on your practice area? Hmm. Do you want me to go first, Elliot? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I was a litigator um, in New York City at a firm, uh, Clifford Chance was my first firm. I think I picked that because in law school, many ways, that's what law school teaches you to be, right? We work on memos, we work on appellate briefs and things like that. Um, and I thought that was the only way you could do uh, writing and research, which are two things that I enjoyed in law school. Now that all said, I really loved my practice and, I, and um, what I did, the firms following that. <laughs> but now that I'm in the internal role that I'm in at the firm now, the um, advice and counsel piece is something I really enjoy doing, being able to say, well, I don't know about that policy. Let's look at it this way and, um, and working on that. So I chose my practice area based on the writing and research thing and sort of what you lose, what you learn in law school. I loved it. I got great experience, but um, there's a lot of other cool things lawyers can do as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, thanks, Kim. I agree completely. So I actually started out of law school. I went directly into financial services. And at the time, I joined a broader legal and compliance division within a financial services company. So over time, I have seen organizations evolve and move from these broader based legal and compliance divisions into separate legal divisions, corporate counsel divisions, and compliance divisions, and compliance and risk divisions, compliance and operations divisions. So again, you really have to be broad in your thinking about what it is that you're doing and the type of work you're working on. So I very much like him, I like policy. I also have a very technical side of myself and I really like applying policy to procedures. And the move I decided to make coming out of law school was to join the industry at an interesting time. It was post 9-11 when there was a completely new set of rules and regulations that were hitting the financial services firm to develop anti-money laundering compliance programs. And nobody had it, nobody knew how to do it. And so the creative part of me thought, what a great chance to apply my technical learning and skills from a legal perspective, being able to understand a rule, translate it into an internal policy, and then break that down even further into a process or procedure that people could follow every day. So I really use that as an opportunity to develop my program building skills. And I was able to broaden that out as I continued in my career over time. And I've worked on building all different types of compliance programs. Perfect. And how has your section supported you in your practice area? Well, what's great about the women in law section is that you meet people from every practice area because it isn't based on a practice area itself. You know, those are incredibly valuable, right? Like being part of ComFed for years um, was fantastic for me in my career. And I got to meet the judges and be part of programs. And I still go back and do things with them, you know, on occasion. They asked me last spring. So, um, so it's great to have the those based on the practice area, but women in law section, young lawyer section, LGBTQ section, 50 plus section, let me know, Amanda, if I missed anybody, <laughs> those sections not based on a practice area really provide you the opportunity to connect with people who do a variety of different types of work. So it's helped me in my work by um, giving me different viewpoints, letting me see things from a different angle, from a different um practices angle. I'm in a business law firm. You know, I need to not just think of this like someone who used to do litigation and internal investigations, right? <clears throat> I need to think of it more broadly. And so having colleagues in financial services, labor, and other fields really helps um, educate me in a lot of ways and really supports, I think, the growth of my career uh, every day. I also, Kim, I'd like to add that I find this section to be extremely supportive and a wonderful place to get involved and to begin your networking journey that you will continue to maintain throughout your career. Um, I enjoy it personally. I enjoy it professionally. I'm very thankful for the section. I actually became a member last year when I decided for myself to have a transition from a career perspective. And it's been wonderful to Kim's point, the amount of topics that we talk about, the quality of the people and the professionalism that the section really promotes is inspiring. And I highly recommend you think about it as an option for you as you, you know, continue your studies, but also again, think about coming out of them and into your first professional steps after school. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to jump around a bit because um, we're talking about your section. So what does your section offer law students? So sorry, say that one more time. What is um, things that your section offers law students? Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, Fine. so we also have um, a great publication. Um, we twice a year publish Wills Connect, which I have to say just gets better and better. Um, as we go through it, it there's substantive articles um, on often Supreme Court cases and, you know, little things like that, but also articles about how to be successful, how to um, attack challenges that you're facing. And they're just incredibly, um, Terry Mazur 
one of our former section chairs has been editing for a couple of years. So just, it's incredibly well done. So there's chances to get published or get experience editing and working with us. We have a great legislative um, affairs committee who often needs some research done and you can connect with people that way. Uh, our annual meeting, we're really in the thick of that, right, Allie? Right yeah. now, our annual meeting planning, Amanda knows very well that we're in the thick <laughs> of it. <laughs> but, it's a great way to get involved and to meet people. And, you know, we're all over the place. So our meetings are often held on Zoom while we're doing this planning. And you are the experts at having meetings on Zoom because you went to part of your school that way, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we know that you can get things done and any way we can find an opportunity to get uh, law students involved, we really will. Perfect. Um, and what's one piece of advice that you would give a law student? You want to go first, Ellie? Oh, sure. Thanks, Kim. I, I can't, you know, recommend enough to be broad in your thinking and to always be open to meeting people and opportunities. You really never know what will come. And the best you can do to prepare for it is to be open-minded. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's, that's excellent advice. And when I was um, teaching in a, an assistant dean at a law school, I used to say that first, you have to be your own best advocate because in a very short amount of time, someone else's life, liberty, or property is on the line when you speak, talk, or act. So first you have to be your own best advocate. It's kind of like that airplane thing of putting your mask on first. So don't let your career happen to you, right? Don't just be like, well, this is the job I got. I guess this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. Take some control over it. Do what Ali said, network, get to know people, be connected and, you know, be honest with yourself about what it is you're looking for while you do all of that. Um, so be your own best advocate as you sort of make your plan going forward. Yeah. And know that it will change, right, Kim? I mean, oh, yes. things happen all of the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be okay with that, right? Like, first of all, please be okay with that if you're going to be a lawyer because things happen that you're like, that was not supposed to go that way. Yeah. But, right? So. <laughs> The same thing will happen in your career. Things will change. An opportunity will come up. I'm, I'll be incredibly candid with you. I was at the law school and I got a phone call that said, hey, will you um, read this job description for me? And I said, from a law, this law firm, and I said, do you want me to read the job description or apply? And mm -hmm. they said, apply. And so you have to sort of be open to those moments. Yes. Perfect. So I'm going to open up for Q&A if anyone has any questions. In the meantime, what's one misconception that you had during law school about your area of practice? Well, Ellie, did you even know any, like, if, but, like so what was new for me? I, I didn't know what to expect him. No. What is Sarbanes? What is Sarbanes? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah, I think, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I just was agreeing. I, I think, again, the level of change from in this case, a regulatory perspective is a, a complete unknown. There are changes all of the time. You you go into it thinking one thing, you build a compliance program a certain way and you just can't leave it. You have to stay with it. You have to monitor for regulatory changes. You have to track yourself for business changes, business strategies change all of the time. So, you know, going into something and thinking, well, I've accomplished this and I've done it and I'm done is not the way to approach your professional days. It is really about setting that bar, checking the bar, setting it higher, checking again, and you know, seeing which way it goes. It can go left, it could go right, it could go up, it could go down, but really understanding sort of where you are at with what you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. It would be nice if the checklist worked, but you cross it off and it doesn't usually go away. Right. So, <laughs> it just means you have to put the next thing on the list, the second part of it. Um, I'd say, you know, for litigation, I, I knew I was going into corporate um, litigation and I, I really, internal investigations were a big part uh, of what I did, which was really fun. Um, I mean, I guess I thought I would be honestly writing even more than I did or not realizing as this profession has evolved, how much of the writing you do is actually an email. <laughs> You know, so you have to make sure that you are putting all of your best self into that email, right? That's how they're going to see you. This is how you're going to communicate with the partners you work for, with your clients, with other people. So, you know, it wasn't just like lovely 
briefs with backing, which you don't even know if those are anymore because it's um, all uh, filed electronically, but that the ways we communicate in real life become part of our um, profession and you have to, you know, make sure that you are um, still doing that as if you were submitting a brief. Yeah, it's great advice, Kim. Perfect, so it looks like we have a question. It says, what gender, uh, what gender justice initiatives does the section have and how does the intersectionality inform those initiatives? So, um, well, intersectionality is such a big word. It can be in a variety of ways, um, whether it's, um, you know, gender identity itself. We do have um, a committee of the section that really takes a deeper dive um, into issues of gender identity and expression. Um, so that is part of the women in law section. Um, and it, intersectionality is, um, also, of course, can be part of race, religion, um, anyone who's living with a disability or a variety of other ways. So we try to address um, issues um, in different ways. I think one way you can learn more about how we do that is if you read our um, report from last year after the Dobbs decision, which is available on NISBA's website, and our attempt to really broadly define who might be a childbearing person mm -hmm. and to um, take into account issues of intersectionality with um, issues of health for women and particularly women of different races. So um, we try to focus on a lot of those issues, issues of um, domestic violence we pay attention to, and we've really been focused on pay equity. And of course the disparity with racial um, pay equity as well, and how much further behind women of color are um, with earnings um, and as everyone else doing the same job in this country. Mm. Perfect, you got a thumbs up. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, we're still open for questions. You guys have about 10 minutes. Is there anything else you'd like to add in regards to your section? Um, well, we are next year. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the um, Equal Rights Amendment is not part of the New York State Constitution, but it has been passed by two consecutive um, sitting uh, sittings of the New York State Legislature which means it will be on the ballot in November of 2024. So you will be able to, if you vote in New York state, you will be able to vote on the Equal Rights Amendment in New York state. People I think assume we have it already, um, but we do not. Uh, and so our annual meeting um, programming will be about civics education and letting people know they will be able to vote on this. Here's what's on the referendum. You know, Here's what um, what you can do, how you can impact this. And um, we're working on a lot of educational um, opportunities throughout next year. So we're kind of saying each one, reach one, making sure that we educate ind individuals, the voters of New York, that this is up to them. So join us in that effort. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to add, Allison? Put you on the spot. <laughs> no, I just, I'm really grateful for the section, Amanda. I mean, I'm so thankful that I met Kim and Laura and other folks who are very actively involved in planning all of these wonderful programs and trainings and communications and educational opportunities for everyone. Please take advantage of it. It's not something that, you know, is just there. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And you should really, you know, look into it, see if it's for you. Yeah, I would. Thanks, Ali. And I would just say that it is really, um, it is a group of attorneys that is focused on working together, not against each other. And I mean, I think a lot of the sections are, you know, very positive. But for us, I, I just, I'm amazed at how much we get done together. And, how, and really, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to get to know all these women. Fretra De Silva is our incoming chair, Cheryl Geller, um, Terry Mazur, and Susan Harper are past chairs. So for those of you who don't know, we were a committee for a very long time, a committee on women in the law, and that's when I first became involved. And so committees of the state bar are appointed. So you can only have about 45 people um, as part of the committee. And then a group of us under Susan Harper's leadership said, hey, I think we should be a section so more women can be involved. And that was just a few years ago. And now we're a thousand members strong and really working to um, 
you know, educate, promote, uh, hype up <laughs> yeah. the, uh, uh, folks around us. And so uh, we really would love to have you get involved. Perfect. Thank you so much. I was like, I'm muted. <laughs> so it looks like we have Marcella on here from Young Lawyer. So I'm just going to thank you guys for your time. Um, thanks very much. Thanks for all your time, Amanda. Take thank care, everyone. You. Bye. Thanks, Haley. All right. Perfect. So next we have Marcella Jean from the Young Lawyer section. Uh, if you just want to briefly introduce yourself and tell you a little bit about your section. Sure. I'm not um, the most knowledgeable about the Young Lawyers section as of yet because I joined it very recently and taken a leadership role in it very recently. Um, but generally, the purpose of the Young Lawyers section is to help attorneys who have less than 10 years experience practicing law helping them advocate as a group among practicing attorneys and also meeting their needs in terms of what kind of CLEs do young lawyers need? What would they benefit from? What kind of skills workshops would be useful for them? And what kind of just advocacy in the profession would be helpful to young lawyers? Because young lawyers have specific and, and different interests than our older peers. And we came up in a different time. Um, so that's sort of the purpose of the section. And I am a commercial litigator. I've been practicing for six years at Foley and Lardner. And I went to Fordham Law School. Perfect. Um, so how did you decide in your practice area? Um. I was a public interest person and I really wanted to do public interest. And then I had a, a public interest um, mentor pull me aside and basically explain that I would be poor forever if I did that and that my grades were good enough. So I should try OCI. And then when I did OCI, the other advice he gave me was like, nobody cares about your aspirations when you're doing these interviews. Like it really doesn't matter what you want to do. The point is to get as many options for yourself as you can. So I never, I always wanted to be a litigator because that's, I mean, growing up watching lawyer shows, that's what you watch. You don't watch transactional people. <laughs> God bless them. I mean, if there weren't people making these contracts, then I wouldn't have any work to do. Um, but you know, that, that was always the contention. I mean, and also someone who's public interest driven, it was like the the call of a battle and hopefully it would be a righteous battle and a good battle that could change something, um, a way to bring about justice or even um, reconciliation and fundamentally the practice of law is nonviolence. So even, I think, even us corporate litigators do something very positive in the world. So I had that in my back pocket, but if I was doing an interview, I would never say that, you know, oh, I only want to do litigation. I would tell anyone anything they wanted to hear about, oh, I've always wanted to practice in Delaware. It's like not, but <laughs> I just wanted as many options as I could get. So luckily um, I got a summer associate position at a firm, which is Foley, but Foley was a little bit different because they had a small boutique litigation firm that was purchased by a large AM100. So our office is still sort of like a litigation boutique. And a lot of other big firms, they get so niche, it's almost hilarious. It's like, no, you're not a litigator. You're like an aviation litigator or, you know, it it's really gets niche. It's like an industry and the type of practice. And we get to be kind of a little bit more broad than that, which I like. So I get to do different types of commercial litigation. And that's how I landed here. Perfect. And how has um, the section supported you in your career? Oh, I think it's so important to join a section and I'm into. So the young lawyers is really helpful because like I said, young lawyers understand each other in a certain way that um, 
our forefathers don't. Um, we have a lot more debt than a lot of the partners we work for ever had. Um, we face certain things that they haven't faced. So having that camaraderie and that support is really, really critical and important. And the other reason it can be really important is because, and hopefully people don't go through this, but unfortunately it's it, it happens a lot, is attorneys at firms, whether they're big firms or small firms, or even in public interest areas, I'm sure this happens, can be competitive among the other associates in their year. And so the other associates that you work with might not be able to be the support network you need. And I always recommend to anybody, you should get a support network beyond wherever your workplace is, a professional support network, um, because that's going to be so pivotal for you in your career when you have you know, a really difficult client or a really difficult partner or just a really difficult situation, knowing that you have other people you can talk it through with that are somewhat separated from your work. Of course, you have to be careful what you say, but um, generally that's really useful. And then the other section I'm a member of is ComFed for the commercial and federal litigation. And that's, I've been a member of that one longer um, because that's kind of my practice area. And that's also been really useful because of many reasons, but one is that that particular section has a lot of judges who are members. As a young litigator, one of the biggest hurdles is getting over your fear of presenting in court or speaking to a judge. So when you can have a cocktail with a judge or joke with them or talk with them, then when you see them in court, you're like, oh, okay. You know, that's Joe, that's Judge Cohen. Like, I know Judge Cohen. Like, this isn't so intimidating. It's like, you know, I'm telling a story to a professor I had. It's It doesn't have that same kind of terror that sometimes you get as a young litigator. Perfect. And um, how has, like, what, what does your section offer law students? It offers them a lot, especially in terms of networking. I think I think networking is a big part of it, but a lot of it is also the camaraderie. Um, so we have pub nights, I think, that are like once a month. Those are really great. I always love going to them. And um, I actually do like keep people's contact when um, I meet people and we exchange numbers. I, I don't think I understood when I was a law student how refreshing law students can be in a way. So your practitioners, so you're like, oh, you're not jaded yet, and you have ideas, <laughs> and you're, you know, and you're interesting, and you remind, you know, and and we want to help law students, we really do, um, and we're interested in their ideas and their thoughts about this profession and about the world. So you know, I I always tell people like, don't feel bad for reaching out to a practicing attorney. I mean, we get emails all the time um, from law students who are looking for, you know, work or they're getting ready to do OCI and they find random names from the same law school or the same undergrad and they reach out. And I was so terrified in law school. I don't think I ever even did that, even though I was advised to. Maybe I did once or twice and the person didn't respond. And I was like, oh, that was so stupid. How embarrassing. It's like, no, if they didn't respond, they were too busy. It's not because they didn't, you know, they were annoyed by it. Um, the the young lawyers who have a little bit more experience love meeting with and being helpful to law students. And then the other piece is just the CLEs because what I didn't appreciate um, when I was in law school was that law school in no way prepares you to practice law and you, and I don't care what law school you go to, whether it's Harvard or whether it's CUNY, it doesn't matter. You're not learning the vocation of law. You're learning like the theory of law generally, unless you take clinics, then you get a little more of that vocational training about like the actual practice. But when I, you know, I graduated law school and I did good and I did some clinics, but I didn't know how to file anything. 
<laughs> it's like that was a whole like I don't know what you know and then you realize oh there's all these special rules with with filing in New York and they change all the time and you know um it's just kind of it could be kind of terrifying so that's a, another important thing about our section is like figuring out what are those key th- skills that for young lawyers are really helpful to learn to demystify certain things because you're didn't learn them in law school. And unfortunately, a lot of workplaces, you're not really going to get a training. You're just going to get thrown into it and hopefully you figure it out. So it's nice to set aside some actual time for going through something when it's not a crisis and figuring it out. And uh, I'll open it for Q&A, but um, what is one piece of advice that you would give a law student? Um, for getting through law school or for being a lawyer? Um, you can do both. Oh. <laughs> you opened yourself to that. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you're in law school and you absolutely hate it, um, you're in good company. I mean, that's, that's all like, I hated law school so much. So I absolutely hated law school and I like being a lawyer. So that's my my little bit of hope, my little seed of hope there is if you hate law school, that doesn't mean that you will hate the practice of law. The practice of law is very collaborative. Law school, in my experience, because I went to a school that was very much about rankings and, you know, it was very competitive and it wasn't like an Ivy League where they're like, everyone passes. You know, we had rankings, everyone knew the rankings, hyper competitive, but then you, then all of a sudden you're practicing law and it's, it's a team sport. Litigation's a team sport. And even with your opponent, it's a team sport in a way because what people don't see on TV is like how much collaboration and drafting is done between counsel for opposing parties. So I would say if you're a law student now and you hate it, hang in there because the, the profession is very different. And um, my advice for becoming uh, or like being a young attorney or or a brand new associate. Um, Well, there's like a million things I could say. And some of it's just almost so practical, it's boring, but I'll give you one. (laughs) If you make a document and I did this, so I say it with no judgment because I've done it myself and you save the document and you title it something like brief or complaint, don't do that. Like we just got in our, (laughs) we just got our brand new first years and I love them and they're smart and they're cool. And they immediately did that. And I was like, you guys, I have a million briefs. I don't know what case this is for. (laughs) Like title things, like be methodical, like figure out whatever protocol you're gonna do blah, 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 be blah, blah, blah. Or some people do brackets with plaintiff, but don't ever send me a document titled brief or complaint. Like don't ever, or a letter, don't ever do that. Um, And then the other thing is just to know that like this job is really hard. If it wasn't, everyone would do it. It is hard. You will have hard days. You absolutely will have hard days. And even the people that you think are like, oh, they're brilliant, they're perfect. I guarantee they've been chewed out. Um, they've made mistakes. They, we, There's no way to play this game correctly. No matter what you do, someone will be unhappy. You, you know, and it could be the judge. It could be your client. It could be the partner you're working for. Or it could be your family that you've completely blown off to work on a brief for an ungrateful client. But I feel like you can do it better when you lose the pretense that this is a winnable game because it's not. And at the end of the day, a lot of, you know, what will give you longevity is not that you're perfect, but that you are resilient. So you can get criticized and say, all right, thank you for the feedback and, you know, discard it if it's garbage. And if it's, if there's some of the feedbacks useful, then certainly use it. But, um, you have to be able to withstand negative feedback and and the tough days and everybody has them. Oh, it looks like they have a question. 
Um, thanks for your tips, Marcella. Going back to being a student and reaching out to lawyers, do you have tips on what to do if they don't respond or stop responding? Do you have to let it go or can you contact them again politely? I absolutely think you can contact them again politely. I like it when law students do that because I'm way too busy sometimes. So it's really not personal and I don't mean to blow people off, but litigators have to triage. So if I have a filing deadline and then I have your email in my inbox and I'm like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to, you know, I'm going to prioritize the filing deadline so I don't commit malpractice. And then you won't even want to ask me a question. <laughs> um, but if I see you email me again, I don't, I don't take offense to that. I mean, if you did it like, you know, to the point of being like a crazy ex-boyfriend and was like 10 in a row, you know, that would be um, alarming. But if, if I say, yeah, I love, you know, I'd love to meet with you. That's perfectly fine. Um, and we go back and you say, does this time work? And I don't respond after a a few days and email me again. So I, I don't think that's rude. I actually really appreciate it. Um, and, you know, not that I borrow money from people a lot, thankfully, because that's the one good thing about this type of job, but it's sort of the same way. Like if you borrow money or you borrow something from somebody and they have all these thoughts in their heads about, oh, I don't want to pester them. And in your mind, you're like, I literally forgot. So thank you. Like I, you know, I don't think that's rude at all. Perfect. We're still open for Q&A. Um, so keep the questions coming. Um, one question I'm going to ask you is like, what is one misconception that you had during law school about your area of practice? Uh, oh, here's one. Um, I think... And it's not just in law school, but I think it's in kind of pop culture too. But for litigators, there's this idea, and especially from that dumb show Suits, which is like such a garbage show, <laughs> but this idea that like litigators are always sassing each other and that anything's accomplished by that. Um I don't waste my time trying to convince the opposing counsel of anything. Like I, that's not useful. I mean, it's not. So it's like, I, that is such a misconception that we have these like fiery, a tit for tat, because, you know, that makes good TV or that makes good drama. And there are some old school attorneys that still do that um, or just, you know, they're whatever, they're belligerent or they have issues at home and then they want to sass other people, but you really don't accomplish anything by it. Like I, if I make an argument about why, you know, the discovery that, that you gave us is deficient, I'll make that argument. If you send me back a letter saying, you know, that's, I mean, you say it in a legal way, but that's totally BS. You're not entitled to this extra discovery that you're saying we didn't produce and we don't have to produce it to you and here's some case law. I don't want to, I'm not going to go back and forth forever with you because ultimately you're not the person I need to convince the judges. So my threshold of convincing my adversary of anything is only to the point I can avoid going to the judge. If I can't convince you, then I'll say, all right, we'll go to the judge and I'm not going to raise my voice and I'm not going to holler at anybody and um, I think really good lawyers, really good litigators are very calm people, actually. And they're very measured, not like on TV. You know, they're not getting in all their jabs. Um, they're surgical. They're so sharp that you don't even feel the cut and they just know what they're doing. And the same thing with depositions. We see like, or even um, examining witnesses like in TV where they're sassing them and they're it's like, if you're really good at examining a witness, they don't even feel like they're being examined. And that's how you get them to say something that maybe they shouldn't have. Perfect. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, we are waiting for the other person to jump on, but anything, any um, other advice or anything else about your section that you may you offer? Know, I, any what? Anything else about the section that you may offer? I mean, 
All I can say is that the more of you that get involved, the more the section can take on certain issues. And I would love to see that. I would love to see um, the section bring the bar's attention to student debt and have them handle that. And right now we know the, the political situation is really polarized and a lot of um, summer associates have had offers rescinded. And, and so there's like, there's certain issues to younger attorneys that are really interesting and they're like hot topics and they're very consequential for us. And the more that we get more people involved, the more we can explore these issues. So I encourage you all get involved, at least come to a pub night because, you know, why not? The stakes this one's are in Albany today. Yes. Yeah, they're normally in New York City. <laughs> I know. We try to be good, though, about, like, doing them all around. And even in New York, we do ones in different boroughs. We had one in the Bronx, which is where I live. And I was so sad because I missed that one. But um, we try to be good about it. Yes. So um, you have another question. Um, would you have just one uh, interview tip for a law student? Oh, yes, um, I do. I absolutely do. Um, if you sterilize yourself to the point that you are broadly acceptable to everyone, no one's really going to want you. If you're authentic, you will alienate some people, but the people that like you will really like you and they will really fight for you to get hired. Um, because I know some students are like, oh, I have to have this corporate veneer. I can't be too anything, right? And those are the ones, because I do so many interviews, I'm like, yeah, they have good grades, they seem fine. But when I meet someone who's authentic and lets me see something really interesting or vulnerable or unique about them, those are the ones that I fight for and I argue with my boss. And I'm like, no, we have to give them an offer. Like, Michaela was fine, but but she was interesting. Or like, you know, so don't don't scrub your identity to the point of being boring. That was a good question. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to add? You have so much insight and I feel like it's so good for the for the law students to, to hear from you. Yeah, I wish I could go back in time so many times and smack myself. <laughs> 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 Things I didn't know. Um, I don't know, anyone can reach out to me. It's M. Jane at Foley, J. A. Y. N. E. I'm always happy to talk to law students. It's refreshing. It's nice. They said thank you so much, by the way. Oh, Sorry. good, good, good. Yeah, because um, I don't know. It's so nice to be here to see like the new energy brought into this profession, and and think about the ways too that will we will change the culture of this profession. I mean, we already have so. And even in the short time I've been practicing, things have changed quite a lot. So I'm very hopeful that the values of younger lawyers shape the culture and make it even better. What are some um, programs that young lawyers is currently like working on? Like, I don't want to say programs, ideas or... I don't know the word. I can't think of it. Initiatives? That yes. Can be kind of a, yes, <laughs> initiatives. So we actually have, we have some interesting ones. One thing, I mean, we're going to have our annual meeting that will be in New York City um, at the Hilton. And we're going to be doing headshots for members so they can get, which is great for law students uh, to have like a, their little corporate headshot. Um, that's very useful for your LinkedIn's and, and whatever. And um, so that will be this winter in New York. And then, like I said, we keep doing the, um, the pub nights as always. And then we're actually working on um, drafting like protocols for how the other sections interact with the young lawyer section, because and this started before I joined, but it made sense. So like people want our sponsorship, but they don't really want our input. <laughs> you know, like, so there's that advocacy piece again. And it's like, okay, yeah, 
that's also kind of parallel to when you're a young attorney and it's like you do all the research you do all the drafting but don't worry we'll put my name on it and uh <laughs> When I succeed, you know, I'll I'll tell the client we won. Um, so, you know, we kind of stick up for the young lawyers. And also I, the other interesting thing that is kind of exciting to people is that we will be sponsoring a trip to D.C. for people who want to be admitted to the Supreme Court. Not that any of us will ever argue there, but, you know. It's an interesting ceremony, so probably a fun trip. I haven't done it yet. I'm thinking of trying to do it this year. You guys are also co-sponsoring the Trial Academy. Yes, yes. And that's the skills stuff. I haven't done that. I haven't done the Trial Academy, but I've heard it's great. And again, you you don't really get training in work that much, so... <laughs> It's better to do it with a mock trial or, you know, to like go through it that way than to suddenly be in there and not know what you're doing. All right. So for students who are not based in New York, which events are really worthy going to New York for? I would definitely say the annual meeting. Definitely go to the annual meeting and There'll be, um, not that everything revolves around drinking, but there will be like, um, you know, a pub night there too as well. <laughs> and then the DC trip, I mean, that's not in New York anyway. So that will be like, that will be in May. Um, but that might be fun to do like a convoy with a few friends and go out to DC and get admitted. I want to add, I think, as someone who took part, not part, but I was there for a trial, the trial academy, I would definitely say trial academy as well. It's definitely something that they should look into. Yes. I think you guys are sponsoring, uh, possibly, don't, don't quote me on it. I think you guys <laughs> are sponsoring someone at some point to go. Yes. 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 I think, um, and ComFed sponsors someone too, to do it. Um, yes. so it is great. And I have, have not been, but I've consistently heard that it's great. You should come. Yeah, It'll I should. And we also, center. we also have, um, an interesting thing coming up. That's like co-sponsored between ComFed and the young lawyers. And it's for female attorneys. I'm not saying people should schlep out to New York for this, <laughs> but um, they wanted like experienced lawyers and young lawyers and experienced lawyers to practice doing oral advocacy things. And then there's going to be a panel of judges to critique them. And I'm like, I don't know how they got volunteers for this. <laughs> <laughs> but one of my colleagues, um, God bless her, she's going to do it. And I was like, oh, Kate, like who bullied you into that? <laughs> Um, but you know, she's willing, I think that's, that's kind of great though. Cause then you can see someone else get critiqued, um, and it doesn't have to be you. So that's nice. Yes. Yes. All right. So it looks like we have Sam on. I wrangled enough time out of you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you talking to us. And, and like I said, reach out. I don't mind it at all. Yes. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. So next we have the LGBTQ law section and we have Sam who will be talking on their behalf. Hi, Sam. How are you today? I'm good. How are you today? Good. Um, if you just want to introduce yourself and tell them a little bit about yourself and then a little bit about your section. Sure. Uh, my name is Sam, uh, and I am a trust and estates attorney at Capel Barnett, Madelon, and Schoenfeld. Uh, we're based in Midtown Manhattan, uh, and uh, I went to Syracuse uh, for law school, and uh, have been. I graduated in 2019, and have been pretty involved in uh, NISBA since tw uh, the beginning of 2020, right before COVID. Uh, and I felt like it was hugely beneficial to uh, my career. I got, I was able to network and find my, uh, find a job through it. Uh, and I was uh, really involved in the LGBTQ section. And I really liked 
uh, being able to, you know, kind of get some exposure and do some, uh, uh, do some work in the LGBTQ legal space without being, you know, an LGBTQ, um, you know, civil rights lawyer. Um, I feel like trust in the states is a really, um, you know, I really find that area of the law really interesting. And I like that on the day to day, but I really like, you know, I really like the balance of, of um, doing some, some good, good work uh, for the LGBTQ community with my involvement in the section. Perfect. And how did you decide on your practice area? Yeah, you know, I, um, I really wanted, uh, with Trust in the States, I really wanted to, um, uh, you know, really wanted to help people. I wanted to have a very meaningful impact on people's lives. And I felt like Trust in the States was a really good fit for that. And, um, and also too, within my practice uh, at the at the firm, I started my career at a majority of our clients were LGBTQ. So it was also another way to give back to the community without, um, uh, again, without, you know, being a civil rights litigator or anything like that. And so I really enjoyed that. Um, and, uh, it's, you know, and at the end of the day, um, whether you're, uh, helping, um, you know, uh, a couple, uh, come up with their estate plan, uh, so that everyone's taken care of, you're giving them peace of mind, which is really, uh, rewarding, um, and also, um, you know, helping uh, executors or family members of, of a loved one, uh, walking them through the estate administration process and making it that much easier for them uh, as they grieve uh, uh, grieve the loss of a loved one. So so that's, that's why I chose this practice area. And how does your section support you in your career? Yeah, so the section, I, again, it's an excellent networking opportunity, and it's uh, the LGBTQ section I find is unique in that it's it's not just an affinity bar, but uh, there are practitioners in every area of the law in New York State. So, you know, you may, um, you know, I find like I, if I come up across like a complicated tax matter uh, in in my work, there's usually, you know, someone I can reach out to uh, and call and be like, hey, like, you know, could you help me walk me through this? Or um, uh, or there might be um, a prospective client that comes through the door that really needs more of an elder law, uh, elder law expertise, perhaps like helping with Medicaid benefits. And so um, I can, you know, I can direct them to someone I know in the section uh, who practices in that area, for example. And it also goes the other way too. Folks know that I'm a trust in the state's attorney, and they can uh, they can connect me with a potential client. Uh, but in addition to that, it's just um, um, I find uh, not just for those, uh, you know, client specific um, issues, it's also uh, the section activities uh, are also involved in some pretty cool endeavors. Oh, the best example I can think of was um, uh, being a contributing author to an amicus brief to the Supreme Court. Uh, on uh, uh, Fulton v. City of Philadelphia and 303 Creative v. Alenis. So that was awesome to be a part of uh, that writing process and getting to uh, work with folks who have vast expertise in this area and uh, me playing a very small part um, in it. So it was really just ensuring that the footnotes, uh, you know, using the blue book and ensuring that the citations were correct, you know, <laughs> so um, so it was cool to play a small role in that process. Perfect. And um, what does your section offer law students? Yeah, so law students, we encourage you guys to attend. If you if you guys are based in uh, the New York City area, we encourage you to attend our events. Uh, we are having a holiday mixer uh, on uh, uh, December sixth, which is a Wednesday in um, in Hell's Kitchen at the Dickens. So uh, we encourage you to come. And again, it's a great way to meet folks, uh, other LGBTQ identified attorneys and allies, um, and uh, you know potentially you know, could be, could be an opportunity to meet and who knows what, what could happen down the line. And uh, we also encourage uh, law students, uh, if they have a particular area of, of uh, interest, the, if they want to contribute to um, our blog or write a post for our website, we, we think that's probably the best 
um, best use of, um, you know, best use of your time. I understand like being a law student, I had no time for anything extra, but I could, you know, write a 600, 800 word thing that's on a blog. It's like quick and dirty. You could probably even take like a portion of something you've already done for class uh, and then use that you know, for uh, a quick and dirty blog post. Um, so that's just, uh, and it's another way to get your name out there. You can put it on LinkedIn um, and, you know, potential employers could see that you're involved. I mean, especially too, if you're interested in um, practicing in, in, um, uh, in the law in, in a more specific LGBTQ field, like that could just, you know, uh, you know, boost your resume. So it's um so I think that's one of the best ways that law students can get involved. And then as they you know graduate, you know being familiar with the section members, you can get involved in more uh, uh, leadership opportunities uh, within the section. So um, uh, so yeah, so that that's um, th those are a few ways that law students could get involved. Perfect. And what is one piece of advice that you would give a new law student? New old. Uh, in between. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like uh, probably the best advice is really know what you're looking for. Um, I went to law school a bit later um, in life. I was later in life. I was 27. So I wasn't like, you know, so, um, but it, it's really good to know what you're looking for as your, um, uh, um, just a general sense, like, for example, I knew I was not a big law person. You could not pay me enough to do big law because I, I like to have a work-life balance. And so I knew um, when I was looking for, for jobs, I was looking at small to mid-sized firms. And now I'm, now I'm at a mid-sized firm and it's a really good fit for me. Um, and, but, you know, but if you know you're a big law person, then like, great, that means, you know, there's certain things you have to do to, to achieve those goals. So I think that's really important to keep in mind. Um, and I think uh, it's not just what you do in the classroom, it's who you meet and who you know, and, um, uh, you know, organizations like the State Bar Association are great for meeting people across the state. Um, and if you know you want to practice in Rochester or Albany or or down down in the city, it, it's important to get to know folks like in those areas, because then once you become a 3L and you're, you know, 3L fall and you're looking for for jobs, then you have, you know, then you have leads um, that can help point you in the right direction for what you're looking for. Yes. Yes. Um, I just want to add that I feel like you guys also have people out of state as well. Um, mm -hmm. So they'll be able to learn about that as well, which is good. Um, what is one misconception that you had during law school about your area of practice? Oh, I thought, well, I thought there'd be more celebrity wills, but apparently like, um, like we had, um, there's a lot of celebrities like that don't have wills or surprisingly have really poor estate plans. I thought I'd run into that more. Um, actually, I was surprised at um, the number of LGBT uh, LGBTQ folks that um, are getting estate plans now. I think after marriage, it's been more uh, of a priority. Um, but we also get um, uh, single folks too um, uh, wanting to get estate plans done as well. So that that's been, um, I guess, su surprising as a way. And the, and the practice of law is very different from what you're taught in in school. I think I think trust in estates is. Um, I I, fi I found that class to be very enjoyable. Um, and so I really find it interesting. And I always feel like, you know, you, you like after a few months, you understand the basics uh, of, of this practice of law, but then there's, there's one fact that changes everything and you have to, um, you know, it, it just, um, it, it has an impact that you didn't, you didn't foresee or um, uh, you kind of have to roll with the punches in a way. So I, um, so I found that. Uh, to be an exciting, uh, exciting thing to learn about. So I'm going to open up for um, question and answers. So if anyone has any questions, just put it in the Q and A. Um, while we wait, what is your guys' focus for annual meeting this year? 
Yes, so our uh, focus for annual meeting is uh, combating the uh, tide of uh, anti-LGBTQ plus legislation in the United States uh, and uh, and across the world. Uh, so we're currently, uh, we're focusing on immigration and asylum claims uh, uh, as one of the CLE programs. We've uh, found that there's been an increase in asylum seekers uh, seeking protection uh, in the U.S. Uh, based on their LGBTQ plus status. And this is based on um, uh, largely in part, we're focusing in East Africa as um, uh, as the those laws have been passed uh, uh, in Uganda uh, and other countries. And so we want to focus on that. So we're partnering, partnering with a law firm uh, that's uh, uh, drafting a report uh, as we speak on those issues, and we want to share those findings with um, uh, with the membership at, at annual meeting in our virtual CLE program. Uh, and then, um, uh, and then we also we're currently just planning uh, the other CLE program. It'll be two programs that are virtual, uh, and we're uh, you know we're uh, brainstorming ideas for our next one um, because there's just been so you know. I think just in the past two or three years, it just seems like it just keeps on coming. And, and at, at some point you just feel like um, you're at a loss of what to, you know, of, of what to do or what can I do as a New York law student, as a New York attorney uh, in a state that's, you know, friendly to LGBTQ rights, you know, what, what is our, our place in all of this? And um, uh and I think a, a good example of what our section has done recently uh, is we've promoted, uh, New York has, um, uh, to make a long story short, um, a judicial bench card that <laughs> was uh, developed in the Ninth District of New York. And this bench card uh, provides guidance to judges on um, appropriate uh, uh, LGBTQ plus uh, language, uh, as well as how to properly address someone with uh, 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 with pronouns, with appropriate questions, so that the courtroom uh, is a respectful place for for everyone. And uh, this was developed in New York State, uh, and it was adopted statewide. And our role as the um, as the voice of the New York uh, of, of New York State was that we introduced this bench card to the American Bar Association uh, last February uh, as a guide for other states to adopt so that the courtroom is a respectful place for LGBTQI plus folks. So that's the type of work we do. And um, uh, and it, it, it felt great to like be at that conference and see all of these states um, approve this bench card. And uh, it was great. I think that's the role that we can play as we combat the tide of LGBTQ plus legislation uh, in other states. Perfect, so it looks like we have a question. Um, any tips on being an LGBTQ member and looking for a job? Should I write on my resume that I'm part of an LGBTQ association, for example? Um, and are the members of this section open to being mentors to LGBTQ law students? Yeah, so uh, so on the first point, um, you know, I, I, you know, I would, um, you know, in terms of um, listing a um, organization, I mean, I'm I'm a proponent for you know for honesty and integrity um, because if this firm looks at your resume and sees that and then tosses that resume aside, you do not want to work there. You know what I mean? So there's plenty of other opportunities for you um, and you're going to be much happier. So, um, and especially if you have a leadership role in this organization, I would definitely want, I would highlight that uh, in your resume uh, uh, because it just shows initiative and it shows that, um, uh, it, you know, any leadership role looks looks good for it for for an employer. Um, but it also depends on the type of uh, um, the type of work environment you're looking for and, and where. If you're looking in a smaller 
you know, but this is very stereo, I'm, you know, stereotyping here, you know, I feel like in the city, things are more open, you know, in Manhattan, but uh, elsewhere, it might be a different story. So um, it's often most helpful to talk to folks who you know, who are who are working in these firms, just to get a general sense of the culture. Um, and if you feel like, okay, this is a good place for me to apply. Um, and I can I can feel confident listing, uh, listing that I was part of outlaw, for example. Uh, and then uh, what was the, the second point, uh, the second question? Um, second question, let me pull back up. So any tips on being LGBTQ member looking for a job? Um, should I write it on my resume? You answered that. So, and, and are the members of your section open to being mentors to LGBTQ law students? Yes, so um, I'd say our members are open uh, to being mentors, especially if um, you're interested in a particular um, practice area. So, for example, like I'm a trust and estates attorney. If you're interested in that field, like come, like talk to me and email me, and then you know we can, you know we can you know talk shop a bit and then discuss you know uh, what you're looking for. But um, I'd also recommend if you're looking for a more formal system of membership, I would recommend um, uh, uh, the LGBT um, LGBT Bar of New York. Uh, they're um, another organization outside of NISBA, but they have a more formal uh, mentorship program, and they really have the capacity uh, for like like formal mentorship. So I would. Uh, seek that out if that's something that interests you. Um, but the best way to find a mentor is, you know, get involved, come to come to events, um, you know, see if there's like a, you know, genuine connection uh, with with someone you meet there. And then, you know, uh, then after that, you know, the mix, the initial mixer, you know, request you know, request to get coffee with them, uh, and then, you know, sit down, learn a bit more about each other and what you're looking for. Uh, and then if it's a good fit, then, you know, down the road, you'd be like, oh, you know, I'd really like you to be my mentor. And actually, um, at um, uh, for me, like one of the mentors uh, uh, I have at the state uh, at the state bar association was, you know, formally, uh, formally the chair of the section. So it, it's, you know, it's, you um, you know, it's definitely it. You know, we 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 definitely would be open. That members would be open to that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so that's the questions we have for now. So we're still open for questions. If there's any more questions, feel free to add those. Is there anything else you'd like to um, include in regards to your section? Yeah, um, so if you're in the New York area, uh, come on down to the Dickens on um, Wednesday, December 6th. Uh, I believe it's on 47th and 8th uh, for our holiday mixer. We'd love to see you. Uh, and you can learn more about the section and meet folks. Um, and our annual meeting is uh, is uh, in January. So the virtual CLE program is January 23rd. And we will be planning um, uh, an awards reception for the Vanguard winners. Uh, for the We have an award ceremony for uh, folks who have um, uh, who have done exemplary work advancing LGBTQ plus rights. Um, uh, and uh, so there will be a reception for that as well in January. So uh, we do have that coming down the pipeline. Um, and again, if you're, um, you know, want to get your name out there, want to get more involved, um, you know, and if you have an interesting, if you've done research in law school about uh, some type of law that is re relevant to the LGBTQ plus community, you know, feel free to email me and uh, share your idea and then we can make it a blog post or, um, uh, or, some, or, or some other uh, writing opportunity for you to showcase your work on the NISBA website. And then, you know, you can, you know, you can share that on your LinkedIn. Great. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, so it doesn't look like we have any questions at this time. So I just want to thank you um, for giving us your time and talking about your section. Sure. Yeah, of course. Happy to do it. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.
So before we end the segment, I just want to let everyone know of the last two um, upcoming meet and greets that we have, um, Tuesday, November 14th, as well as Thursday, November 16th. Um, these are the remaining sections that have yet to speak. Feel free to join us and sign up today. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to email me as well. Um, so at this time, that will conclude our program. Thank you so much for taking part in it.